Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today uh, on understanding bird migration. We'll get started in just a second once uh, everybody is filtered into the room. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Smaha, and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. Thank you so much for joining us today for an exciting discussion about bird migration. Whether you are a beginning birder or have decades of experience, we hope that you learn a lot today and enjoy our discussion. If you're new to Manomet, uh, for over 50 years, Manomet has been a leader in bird research and conservation. We use science and collaboration to strengthen flyways, coastal ecosystems, and working lands and seas across the Western Hemisphere. We do this work with many partners to help nature and local communities thrive. Today, I'm joined by Evan Dalton, Evan Dalton, director of the Manomet Observatory, who will be telling us all about bird migration. But I have a couple of quick things to share with you before I turn things over to him. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you used to see a, a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, just use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during today's presentation, you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box to enter it. At the conclusion of this presentation, we will answer as many questions as possible. Also, if you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded, and we will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. Finally, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Hemingway and Barnes and Hub for supporting our online educational opportunities this fall, like this webinar that you're going to see today. And now I'm pleased to turn things over to Evan Dalton. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, lunch and learn session today. Um, this, uh, I guess, afternoon at this point, two minutes afternoon. Uh, we will be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is bird migration. Gotta love migration. It's a lovely thing. Uh, right now, we've actually started up our 50, ooh, 56th, I believe, season, or actually, no, fall even goes further back than that, uh, season of migration bird banding here at Manomet Observatory. Um, and uh, as we speak, our bird banders are out there actually uh, pulling birds out of nets and it's just a very exciting time. Uh, we've already seen a few pushes of migratory birds moving through and they'll continue moving through for, uh, you know, as, as long as we keep banding, quite frankly. Uh, the beauty of migration is it's always happening around us and um, it's kind of just a, a cyclical thing. Uh, yeah, as Danielle said, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or uh, the uh, Q&A box down there. Uh, we'll get to those as best we can. Um, and uh, yeah, today we'll just be talking about uh, bird migration. We'll be talking about uh, some theories as to how it came about, uh, how birds do it, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and then we'll actually go through a couple of the birds that you might see uh, around your backyard if you're in the eastern United States. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about their um, migratory patterns. Um, and more importantly, we'll also talk about how we research those migratory patterns. Um, I will acknowledge right now that uh, with these webinars, it's important to note that I am currently in Plymouth, Massachusetts, and I uh, want to acknowledge the fact that I, most of the things I'll be talking about will be from a, a, Easter, a Northeastern United States perspective. Uh, but uh, a lot of these patterns will actually uh, adhere to uh, birds all throughout the world. And uh, I, if you're from somewhere else, that would be awesome. So anywho, uh, it's always weird uh, presenting a webinar because I have no visual feedback from, from, from you. So there could be zero of you right now. We know you and I both know that's not true, though. There's somebody there. Okay. So before I talk about bird migration, we should just talk about migration as a whole. Let's see if this thing will actually work for me. Here we go. Okay, so birds are not the only migrants out there. Uh, lots of things uh, partake in migration. And when we talk about migration, um, I'm generally speaking about uh, seasonal movements from one region to another. 
Um, but uh, here in uh, Mass Eastern Massachusetts, uh, just off of our bluff, particularly in the early spring, we sometimes actually see North Atlantic right whales that are migrating up and down the Atlantic coast. Uh, those things actually somehow go through the Cape Cod Canal without getting hit uh, and then end up in the bay before heading a bit further north uh, to the Maritimes of Canada where they um, feed like crazy on, uh, on uh, migratory fish actually. So we're not covering that. Um, some other migratory uh, fish besides the capelin that these guys eat are things like uh, striped bass, which migrate up and down the Atlantic coast, a uh, very popular uh, fishing target for local anglers. Um, as uh, and not only are, are uh, vertebrates migrants, but we also have invertebrates that migrate. Uh, the most famous one in the U.S. is probably the monarch butterfly here. Uh, which uh, right now, if we start, if we see any monarch butterflies in uh, the Northeast, chances are that those adult butterflies are the ones that will be heading all the way down to the mountains of Mexico, uh, where they'll actually overwinter in sort of a, a meditative state all, all as one. Uh, that image on the right there is a pine tree in the mountains of Mexico that's actually just coated with monarch butterflies. Pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, just want to acknowledge that uh, birds are not the only migrants, but that's primarily what we'll be talking about today. Um, so migration has always been something that uh, fascinates people. Uh, but before we even knew that migration was a thing with birds, people had a whole bunch of different theories as to where the birds that we know during the spring and summer that are singing in our backyards, uh, where they actually go. Uh, so early on, people actually thought that uh, maybe the birds that were here in the summer and aren't here in the winter, maybe like turtles and frogs and things, maybe they just burrow down into the mud in a pond. Uh, and this image here on the left is showing some people pulling some fish out, but you know, they also got some swallows because everyone knows that swallows hibernate in mud. Um, that obviously has been debunked at this point. Uh, other people thought that uh, birds might actually just transmute into other birds or perhaps even other animals that they would see. So it's kind of like, oh, well, as soon as the geese leave, we start seeing a certain species of fish. So maybe the geese just turned into those fish. Uh, we have since uh, debunked transmutation as, uh, as an explanation for where our birds go. And in fact, if you went back in time and told these people that in, instead of turning into a fish, that that goose actually migrates thousands of miles to a different continent every single year and then comes back to the same place it bred, they might think that's a bit more outlandish than transmutation. So, um, but definitely interesting to uh, note that people have been thinking about what birds do uh, throughout the seasons uh, for quite some time at this point. So why would something want to migrate in the first place? And there are a lot of things that drive migration um, from the perspective of birds or other animals. Uh, one of the major drivers is basically food. Um, you know, if, if you eat a specific type of, of plant or organism, uh, your presence is really only going to be able to, uh, to coexist with that, with that thing that you depend on. Um, some creatures are not super hardy to temperatures, so particularly low temperatures. Um, and so a lot of animals and, uh, will end up um, migrating to a place that's a bit warmer. Um, interestingly for birds, uh, a lot of the birds that we see that migrate south out of the area are actually insectivorous birds. And so insects pretty difficult to come by in the middle of February here in the Northeast. Uh, so what we see is that uh, food and temperature uh, are quite related there for insectivorous birds in the northeast of the U.S. Um, day length plays an interesting part in some of these uh, animals' life cycles. This bird on the left is a snowy owl, um, and snowy owls nest on the Arctic tundra. And when they're up there, they can actually uh, hunt all day and all night because during the breeding season, it's pretty much day all the time in the Arctic Circle. Um, and really it's about capitalizing on opportunities too. And that's sort of how we thought, uh, how we think that uh, migration sort of came to be in a lot of the um, 
birds that we see now in, in the United States and in North America. Um, so if we think back, as I'm sure we all recall, uh, about 100,000 years ago, uh, the earth sort of went into a cycle of glaciation. Um, and so there was a giant ice sheet, and this is an image, and we're looking down uh, basically from the North Pole down onto the earth. Uh, so if we look on the right side here, we can see the Laurentide ice sheet, which was the last ice sheet uh, that covered the northern part of North America, uh, as well as Greenland. Uh, and every year that would basically uh, expand and contract. Um, and so you would get uh, this sort of steam shovel effect on the front edge of it. And it was actually that steam shovel of it, this half mile to two mile thick sheet of ice plowing down uh, the Atlantic coast that actually created Cape Cod. Um, it's kind of like uh, when you're snow shoveling and you leave behind a little trail on the edge of the snow shovel, that was Cape Cod. Um, but uh, obviously uh, a giant moving sheet of ice is not going to have much vegetation growing on top of it. So it's not going to be a very great uh, breeding habitat for an insectivorous bird like the ancestral uh, wood warbler that, uh, or several species of ancestral wood warbler that uh, probably occupied any of the non-frozen places in North America. Um, but if we think uh, of a common warbler species that is found throughout North America, uh, it is the, uh, one of them is the yellow-rumped warbler. Um, and the yellow-rumped warbler has two distinct subspecies. Uh, on the west, uh, west of the Rockies, uh, you get the Audubon's warbler, which has a yellow throat. And, and then in uh, the all across the boreal forest and basically the only one we see uh, along the eastern flyways is a subspecies called the myrtle warbler, which has a white throat. Um, and uh, we believe that these two species actually deviated from each other or subspecies deviated from each other uh, when uh, the potential breeding areas were split by a spur in this ice sheet. So if we see here throughout the Midwest, uh, just east of the Rockies, uh, there's a spur right here. And basically there was a nice little breeding spot in the Eastern uh, part of uh, North America for our myrtle warblers to partake in. And uh, it was enough time for them to actually differentiate from each other. Uh, I should say the picture I had on here before is a bird that probably looks very similar to their common ancestor, but that's a, a present day species called the Goldman's Warbler, which if you went down to like Guatemala or something, you might actually see. Um, but uh, that is a non-migratory uh, species of warbler. And so basically a Goldman's Warbler probably moved a bit further north to uh, partake in uh, any of the nice uh, quick, quickly growing vegetation and the insects associated with that vegetation um, along the sort of uh, northern or southern extent of the ice. Um, and so this was sort of a seasonal thing um, and it sort of became part of their routine. Um, and uh, yeah, migration is really all about just sort of capitalizing on temporary booms of food. Um, so for us in the Northeast, it's booms in caterpillars and whatnot. Uh, but uh, for shorebirds that uh, migrate all the way up to the north slope of Alaska, they're capitalizing on booms in mosquito and other aquatic uh, uh, invertebrates that boom in the uh, uh, late spring and early summer. Um, and that amount of food is just enough for them to be able to uh, gorge themselves on food. Uh, raise young and then get enough food uh, to build up enough fuel to get out of there. Um, and that's kind of what they're doing. Uh, it's always a mad dash for them to get back to the breeding grounds and then uh, to uh, get back down south. It's also, a, pro it's also a, a project as well. We'll talk a bit more about the costs of that in a bit, but uh, you can see that for a migratory species, um, half, of their, half of their annual cycle can be taken up by migration. And this is just sort of a generalization here, but uh, for some species, uh, migration can take up a lot more, a lot larger portion of, um, 
of their year. Um, so uh, another interesting bit here is uh, how much larger the overwintering arrow is on the bottom than the breeding. Uh, we like to think in, in, in uh, North America, we like to think of uh, birds like warblers and, and this indigo bunting as sort of, quote, our bird. But in reality, that bird's kind of just taking a, a break from its, its uh, uh, normal dwelling down in its overwintering grounds. Uh, and it's coming up here just, just for a brief period of time to breed and then it's leaving. Um, so we're less of a home than, uh, than the overwintering grounds for many of our, our birds. Um, okay, I'm sure I skipped, I'm sure I'm skipping over some information, so hopefully we can address some of that in the Q&A at the end here. Um, so if you're migrating very long distances, uh, you're going to be dealing with a whole bunch of different uh, constraints. Um, if you have to migrate super long distances to get to where they're going to be invertebrate food, for instance, uh, throughout the winter, um, that obviously in and of itself is quite the hurdle. But when you throw in other things like uh, seasonal weather, weather patterns, uh, this is a hurricane off the uh, South Atlantic coast, um, seasonal storms have been getting more and more intense and uh, these can pose a pretty significant threat to a lot of birds that would be migrating up and down the Atlantic coast, which uh, for us here, it's actually a majority of the birds that we see migrating through are actually using the coastline as a, as a, a guideline. Um, you also need to rely upon uh, prevailing winds to get you to places or, or at least uh, good, good bursts of winds. So if you're headed south, like a lot of the birds moving through our banding lab are right now, they rely upon uh, winds coming from the north or northwest uh, to get them there. Um, a lot of birds are also flying at, at very uh, high altitudes, um, which is something that mammals are just not capable of doing because our lungs are uh, well, our lungs are kind of just like an, an empty balloon. So there's not much structure there. But lungs are actually one of the things that uh, birds have uh, mod or that evolution has modified within birds. And so their lungs are kind of like, um, think of like a series of uh, air filled milk jugs. And so there's a bit more structure there. And because of that, they can fly at higher altitudes. Um, Shorebirds will regularly get within the thousands of uh, meters above, or uh, thousands of feet above ground. Uh, I believe the uh, highest altitude on a bird was a, a migrating uh, griffin vulture, I think, that was hit by a plane at around 30,000 feet. Um, that's pretty dang high. Um, so pretty, pretty incredible what, what their bodies are capable of, of uh, withstanding as far as air pressure goes. Um, Throughout the migratory season, uh, birds are actually capable of undergoing some pretty significant changes in their internal physio physiology as well. Um, this here is kind of a confusing graph, but if you think of, it's basically looking at different uh, metrics or different body parts of a, a migratory species of grebe called the black-necked grebe. Um, uh, we have a black-necked grebes here, but uh, yeah, anyways. Um, the, uh, I would ignore the top line here, but if we look at say uh, breast muscle, and if we look at these um, columns of time as uh, the migratory periods, which is what they are, uh, we can see that for instance, during the uh, months during migration, the uh, mass of the breast muscle, uh, which is very important if you're gonna be going through a, a flight for a long period of time, uh, the breast muscle actually increases in size. Um, whereas the leg muscles, which swell up pretty significantly before migration, they actually drop off significantly. And so they kind of gain a lot more mass in their breast muscle, but lose mass in their leg muscles. Now for a grebe, they're using their legs to propel themselves underwater to eat food. And so prior to uh, migration, they're doing something called staging, which is going to a place that has tons of food and fattening up. Um, uh, birds are very good at metabolizing fat. Um, we humans, or at least me in particular, are not very good at metabolizing fat, but birds are able to basically use it as jet fuel. Um, and so uh, oftentimes birds will uh, really stock up on fat such that their body mass increases significantly. Um, but uh, 
yeah, so their leg muscles swelling a ton before as they're staging. And then once they actually get ready to migrate, they're losing those leg muscles for the breast muscles so they can fly. Um, also, amazingly, their uh, internal organs that are used to digest food actually take a pretty significant dip um, prior, to, uh, prior to their migration. Um, so during migration, they don't really need to be eating food. Um, and uh, that really works out for them. So it's pretty cool. Um, this is a bit less extreme on some of the so uh, in some of the songbirds that we catch here in the banding lab. Um, and that's mostly because they're not making, most of them are not making just one giant flight. Um, they'll be doing a series of uh, relatively short few hundred mile flights. Um, so in between those flights, they then have to uh, stock up on food. So we don't see the, the, uh, the digestive system necessarily taking a huge hit during those flights, but um, pretty, pretty incredible what they're capable of doing. So this is how they sort of prepare for migration, but during migration, how do they actually navigate themselves and orient themselves? Um, and there's been a, a whole series of kind of uh, fascinating formative studies on trying to figure out how birds are able to uh, find their way around. You know, they don't have maps, they don't have uh, a GPS unit now. Uh, so how have they been able to do this? Um, it, amazingly, many species of bird are capable of leaving their natal grounds where they grew up, uh, going someplace maybe 10,000 miles away, and then returning within, you know, meters of where they were, uh, where they hatched out um, the, the following season. So um, pretty incredible what they're capable of doing. Um, and uh, what we found is that uh, as, as far as many of the songbirds that migrate through uh, the Manomet uh, banding lab, <laughs> um, they're actually using the star patterns that they see at night. Um, now, I mentioned that, uh, for instance, a gray catbird that we might see here, uh, it's migrating at night, uh, primarily because there are fewer predators at night, but also it allows them to use available orientation methods like star patterns. And it also affords them the opportunity to eat food during the day. Um, and that's exactly what they're doing. So a catbird that comes in here uh, may have come in from uh, maybe as, 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 as many as 300 miles away. Um, and it will spend a few days with us fattening up uh, in the fall. It's primarily berries um, that they eat. And uh, then it will get up and leave once it's uh, acquired enough fat. Um, and it will leave at night when it's got good tailwinds. Um, so like I was saying before, in the fall, they're waiting for uh, at least a night when there aren't significant winds from the south, uh, which we've had quite a lot recently, but um, that doesn't stop them entirely. But if you can imagine, if you're a bird that flies maybe uh, 30 miles an hour and you've got a 10 mile an hour headwind, you're not going to make nearly as much progress as if you didn't have any headwind at all. So um, they uh, really are, are pretty selective as far as the nights they take off. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we figured out how they uh, use star patterns um, in a second, but uh, they do use other cues as well. Um, many birds, including this uh, homing pigeon here, are able to uh, basically tie into the Earth's magnetic fields. Um, and uh, it's, there's still a ton of debate around what part of the bird is sensitive to magnetic fields, but we're pretty sure it's somewhere in the head um, there's been debate about whether there's uh, a piece of a uh, little piece of magnetite in either their bill or in one of their eyes um, that allows them to sort of be very sensitive to these magnetic fields. Um, but regardless, we're able to figure out it was something that was electromagnetic because they strapped these tiny little electromagnets onto the uh, back and heads of these pigeons. And uh, by uh, basically turning on the electromagnet, it uh, uh, basically scrapped their ability to find their way back. Um, and so uh, we're pretty sure that uh, many birds are uh, queuing into magnetic fields. I would throw out there also that the fact that we get lots of, or that, that 
there is every year an occurrence of uh, vagrant birds. So these are birds that are typically migratory birds that end up in places where they shouldn't be, uh, as far as we humans are concerned. Um, I think that those uh, patterns of vagrancy are probably tied into uh, a polarity switch in whatever magnetic field they're tied into. Um, but uh, what happens if it's a cloudy night and they can't see the stars? Uh, oftentimes birds are able to cue into other uh, maybe softer cues as well. So things like uh, topography, uh, polarized light is something that they're actually able to pick up on, pick up on so they can actually see sort of um, uh, you know, some, some remnants of the sun's light sneaking around the earth. Um, they can also get auditory cues as well. So uh, the topography and auditory cues are things that are very closely associated with the coast. Um, and in the fall, it's no coincidence that a lot of the birds that we see directly along the Atlantic coast are birds that haven't made this tr uh, trip before. Uh, and uh, so they're hatching year birds and um, they are headed down the most obvious north-south boundary there is, which is the Atlantic coast. Um, so they'll follow that. Uh, by the time their second year rolls along, uh, they'll actually migrate a bit further inland and they won't go along the coast as much. So um, definitely uh, it's kind of like the coast is kind of like training wheels for their, their migratory patterns. Um, so not only did we uh, strap magnets to the top of uh, birds' heads in the past, um, but we also uh, put migratory birds in uh, cones at night. Um, I use the term we uh, loosely, uh, but um, this is a pretty neat study in that um, researchers took uh, sparrows that were experiencing what we call uh, Zugenruhe or migratory restlessness, um, which is basically when a bird really starts getting the urge to migrate. So they'll start putting on fat. Um, and uh, that's probably uh, mostly uh, brought on, uh, at least as far as uh, birds breeding in the Northern Hemisphere, um, that's brought on by day length up here during the breeding season. Um, so as the days start getting shorter again, um, oftentimes birds will start singing again. So right now, as the days get shorter, you might experience some a uh, bit more bird song in your backyard. Uh, that's because the day lengths right now are sort of emulating kind of late spring. Um, so the birds are kind of getting that cue. Um, but once they get even shorter, the birds will start getting the urge to migrate. Um, and so these researchers took sparrows that were just getting into that point and they put them in these funny little cones with an ink pad at the bottom. Um, and at night, they put the birds in there and the birds would keep trying to take off in a certain direction. And because they're stepping in ink and then jumping onto the side of the, uh, of the comb, which is lined with paper, um, researchers could then look at kind of where the densest concentration of ink was to see what direction these birds tended to be heading in. Um, and so what they did was they would, they would take one group and they put them out uh, underneath the normal stars uh, and uh, these birds would actually orient towards the stars and head the direction they wanted to head. This was done um, in the spring, so these birds wanted to be heading north. Um, so we can see here in A, this was sort of the control group. Uh, in B, they actually put them underneath a planetarium, uh, and uh, that planetarium uh, had the night sky oriented in the same direction as it would be outside, and the birds still oriented in, in what we would perceive as the correct direction. Now, when they uh, swapped the uh, orientation 180 degrees uh, of the planetarium, the birds actually headed in the uh, quote unquote correct position as far as the stars were concerned, but the opposite position uh, from where they should have actually been heading. Um, and then they also uh, were able to uh, get them to do nothing by completely and totally obscuring the night sky altogether. So in the case of these birds, when they were indoors and totally shielded from everything, uh, any sort of stimuli outside, they just kind of headed in any direction altogether. Um, they've also been able to uh, obscure certain constellations in the night sky and really only allow them to see one or two constellations and the birds can still orient. So 
they have sort of a map of the stars and even with an incomplete map, they can still orient themselves correctly, which is pretty amazing. Um, so these are how we uh, think that they're orienting themselves. Now, how do we figure out where the heck birds actually go? So that actually came about uh, through a, a process we're very familiar with here at Manomet, which is through bird banding. Um, bird banding is basically just uh, capturing a wild bird and placing a permanent marker on that bird. Um, the tried and true method is to basically place a very small metal band on the leg of the bird. Um, and this band uh, these days is made out of aluminum, so it's super lightweight. Um, aluminum also does not rust. And this band, even on this house finch here, has uh, a nine digit number on it that serves kind of as that bird's social security number. And uh, basically if that bird is ever caught again uh, and reported, we now have an idea of where that bird went. Um, and obviously this is a pretty, uh, pretty low level of investment as far as, as humans are concerned. You can put a ton of bands on birds, but also the return on investment is quite low too. Um, so you really have to be, uh, you have to hope that someone's in the right place at the right time with the right bird uh, and with the right knowledge to report that bird. Um, and so it takes a long time to uh, notice patterns and movement of birds. Um, but it really was through bird banding schemes uh, that we kind of finalized the ideas of flyways of birds. Um, at Manomet here, we've actually banded over, or put bands on over a quarter of a million birds. And as far as band recoveries go, so those are these red dots here on the map, which show where birds go uh, once they leave our place. Um, as far as uh, recoveries go, we probably only have about 500 or so. So that's really about, uh, uh, what, two in every thousand birds that we ban that we uh, ever hear from again. I should say off-site. Um, we catch many birds here uh, that we've banded before, um, and that's probably because they're either uh, living on the property or spending a long time on the property, or maybe they migrate through here uh, year after year, um, but they probably live nearby. Um, but you can even see from our banding recoveries here, that primarily the birds we catch are sticking to the Atlantic coast. Um, and it's through banding regimes that we kind of uh, came about with the idea of what a flyway is. So a flyway is basically just a, a, a migratory pathway or a, a flying highway, if you will. Um, depending on who you talk to, there are uh, varying numbers of flyways, but um, uh, these are just sort of generalized patterns of, of what birds do. And uh, they allow us to think of, um, of the swaths of habitats that birds use throughout their life cycle. Um, many people like to think of birds as just being a backyard bird or something. Whereas in reality, a backyard bird might have a migratory route that covers thousands of miles a year and a whole bunch of different uh, biomes. Um, in the cases of many of our birds, they're using the entire uh, Western Hemisphere as part of their migratory pathway. So um, pretty fascinating, uh, but you can see uh, just varying degrees of uh, length of their migratory route. Um, but uh, like I said, a lot of birds, particularly the birds we catch are using the, uh, the flyway that takes them down along the Atlantic coast. Uh, in the fall, they'll cross over Cuba and head on down to uh, Central America where many of our birds end up is uh, Central America and the Caribbean. So that's where uh, things like magnolia warblers and our most common bird here, the catbird, ends up. Um, there's also Pacific flyways. Uh, many of these flyways uh, come from the boreal forest, which is this forest that stretches all throughout um, Central Canada, all the way across from east to west. And the boreal forest is really sort of the, the nursery for, uh, for many, many, many of our uh, migratory uh, birds. And basically, nearly oh, well, almost all of the warblers that migrate through here and don't stick around to breed will end up in the boreal forest. Um, but that's also where things like uh, juncos and um, uh, just 
a whole bunch of things use the boreal forest. Even shorebirds will use the northern reaches of the boreal forest. Things like uh, yellow legs will actually breed uh, in nests that are built in spruce trees right at the edge of, of boreal forests. So uh, pretty important habitat for, for all these things. Um, now these migration routes are, are not just exclusive to the Western Hemisphere. There are also uh, very well documented uh, migration routes that take birds from uh, Europe and Asia all the way down to sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if you think of the Gulf of Mexico as a significant impediment for uh, bird migration here, uh, think of uh, the stretch from, say, uh, sort of the, the southern tips of Greece uh, all the way across the Sahara Desert uh, to get down to where they're going to be overwintering. That's a, a huge barrier for birds and they're able to do this and a lot of them are able to do this in, in one fell swoop. Um, now, how do we know that birds are capable of, of uh, making these massive movements? Um, it's not just through bird banding. There have been a lot of advances in uh, technology that have allowed us to track um, not just overall bird populations, but um, the emphasis these days is on individual birds. Um, so through things like uh, placing uh, radio tags on certain birds, um, we've been able to track movements of uh, things like this uh, Swainson's thrush here that went all the way from uh, northern South America all the way up to the boreal forest in, in a very short period of time. Um, and these were picked up on uh, radio towers that are placed in strategic locations along migratory routes. Um, if you don't have that network of towers, you can put a little thing on a bird called a geolocator that actually just uh, monitors, it, it knows exactly what time it is and it monitors the day length. And by just doing a few extrapolation calculations, you can uh, basically tell where a bird is within a, a hundred miles or so. Um, the problem is you have to catch that same exact bird again and grab that geolocator and download those data. Um, but it's through geolocator uh, data that we're able to tell that uh, one of the species that migrates through here in New England in the fall, a species of warbler called the black pole warbler, is actually capable of fattening up significantly. We'll, we'll catch them a, a, an unloaded black pole warbler with no fat on it, weighs about 10 grams. Um, but we'll regularly catch black pole warblers here that are 18 grams or more. Um, and once they hit that uh, weight threshold and get some good tailwinds, they'll take off directly from here and fly all the way out over the Atlantic for two or three days straight. Um, they'll pick up the trade winds, which push them back into the West Indies, or they might actually push them all the way down to um, Venezuela. And then these birds will then uh, trickle down into the Amazon basin where they'll spend their winter. Um, really an amazing example of, of a tiny, tiny little bird uh, that's capable of just a, a torturous, extreme uh, migratory uh, bout, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, we, there are other ways you can look at uh, genes of birds or isotopes. Um, we've participated in several studies that have shown that the black pole warblers, for instance, that come to us in the fall aren't birds from the eastern part of their breeding population, but they're birds from the western part. Um, so they're coming from as far away as eastern Alaska, and they probably make a very similar flight from their breeding grounds in Alaska all the way to the northeast before they fatten up again and do another bout. Um, and then uh, another technology that you can use on larger birds uh, is satellite tracking. Um, so larger birds, you can put slightly larger things on them, uh, keeping in mind that we still don't want to weigh the birds down because that's bad. Um, but if you put a small uh, satellite tag on larger birds like this shorebird called a whimbrel here, um, you can actually get real-time information on uh, where birds are and where they're going and, and what habitats they're using. And in the cases of that, it's actually really helpful for figuring out um, those valuable stopover sites where the birds are doing what I was describing earlier, the staging. Um, so uh, it, staging points are super important for species because um, that's where they go to uh, stock up. It's like if you if you were in a uh, in, in the before times when you commuted to work uh, and you were on a certain schedule and you always stopped at the same gas station on your way into work, 
um, if that gas station went away, uh, you better hope you're aware that it went away uh, before you run out of gas, right? Um, so those stopover sites are very important and things that give you precise locations like satellite tracking can, can, uh, can help us identify those. Um, one of my favorite aspects and, and obviously things like putting a radio tag on a bird or analyzing the isotopes of birds or something that the layperson probably doesn't have access to and you're definitely not permitted to do that. So please don't do that. But one thing that anyone can do, particularly this time of year, is uh, one of my favorite applications, which is radar ornithology. Um, and if you go online and find any sort of uh, NEXRAD radar imagery, uh, you can basically track bird migration uh, through radar imagery. So I'm going to show you here, this is a composite image from last year in August, um, and this is at sunset. And what we'll see is a bloom of these big spheres of color that look like rain, but they're not moving. And these are migratory birds. And as the sun sets, the birds are taking off across the country. So we see that what we call sort of a bloom of migration all throughout the Midwest, particularly the upper Midwest. This is early in the season. This is late August last year. So a lot of the migratory birds haven't quite made it to the Atlantic coast yet, maybe. They're just uh, staging here and taking off from the upper Midwest. Um, so this is the loop starting over again. And so we can see the sun setting. And just as it sets, the birds are taking off. Um, and they kind of look like donuts. Um, on very strong nights, the, the blues can actually be greens, which are even more intense. Um, there is some precipitation down here in the southeastern US. And uh, that oftentimes can obscure movements of birds. Um, because they use a different uh, scale uh, to detect uh, precipitation or other objects in the atmosphere. Um, but really cool to be able to see this. If you look on a more local scale, here's an instance of how rain moving through can actually influence birds as they're migrating. So this is a stretch of really intense uh, precipitation moving through just after sunset. And you can see the birds getting up, and then just as they get up, the rain moves in and pushes them back down. Um, sometimes that can get that can lead to high concentrations of birds that are put down in places where you wouldn't necessarily expect them. Some people call that fallout. Um, you definitely have to be in the right place at the right time to experience that, but it can be pretty pretty amazing. Um, but these are things you can look at just looking at your local weather radar. Another cool thing you can identify, and this is um, for birds that are diurnal migrants. So birds that migrate during the day are things that can eat on the wing. So oftentimes those are things like uh, swallows and swifts. Um, and swallows will actually form these gigantic roosts. And when the sun comes up, the birds will take off from these roosts and disperse out. And so this is imagery and this is Ohio here, but you see these sort of wisps that all are sort of the same shape. And these are roosts of birds that are, are hanging out at night all together. And as the sun comes up, they're taking off. And you can imagine how large these roosts must be to be able to be picked up and be this large. Like they're almost the size of a county. Um, so this is probably tens of thousands of birds in this roost right here. So if you see something like this uh, on your local radar, you should go check it out at dawn or really at dusk when the birds are coming in to sleep uh, all in the same place. But I think that's really cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to go really quickly through just a handful of birds that you might be familiar with and talk about their migratory strategies. And then we'll do some Q&A. Um, so first off, we've got a non-migratory species, which we all are probably quite familiar with. This is the northern cardinal. Um, and the northern cardinal is a species that uh, does not migrate and it's able to stick around and particularly in the colder parts of its range due to the fact that it has this fantastically huge uh, seed crushing bill. The pattern is, at least in the northeast, that if a bird can stick around for the winter, chances are it's either really, really, really good at finding insects, so something like a brown creeper that's um, creeping around and finding insect eggs, dormant insect eggs in tree bark, or it's something that's able to capitalize on uh, more common food resources like seeds. Um, so a lot of the wintering birds uh, 
in uh, the eastern northeastern U.S. are uh, seed-eating birds like uh, this northern cardinal. Um, through our banding data, we've actually noticed that these guys, we've been able to track their increase um, northwards, um, and they actually were a fairly uncommon bird when we first started banding 50 plus years ago, and now they're quite common, and they're breeding all the way up into Maine now. And that part of that is probably facilitated by the fact that people are feeding birds, um, and that's helping them get through the hardest winters of all. Um, a bird that we catch here, this is our most common, commonly captured bird here by far, this is the gray catbird. Um, a common backyard bird throughout most of North America, except west of the Rockies. Um, and uh, these guys, like I was saying earlier, uh, will overwinter in Central America and in the Caribbean for the most part. Uh, look at the bill on them. It's a very thin, pointy bill, uh, particularly good for, uh, for catching insects and picking them off of leaves or out of leaf litter. Um, and they will eat berries in the fall as they migrate through, but uh, generally speaking, not going to be a seed eating bird. So uh, they've got to head out and uh, enjoy the insects in their overwintering range. Um, a cool phenomenon that you can observe in the eastern U.S. and also western U.S. too, uh, with different species of, of hawks. Um, but uh, broadwing hawks are a one of those diurnal migrants. And they're not necessarily eating on the wing. In fact, they don't do much eating at all during migration, uh, but they don't expend a ton of energy either. They mostly soar on columns of hot air. But those columns of hot air only take place over land. So the broadwing hawk has to migrate over land uh, and they only, take place, they only uh, exist during the day. Um, so broadwing hawks will uh, form these huge groups that sort of all kettle up on the same uh, column of hot air and then soar down to the next one that they encounter. Um, but in certain spots, there are lots of hawk watches and you can see thousands of these things stream by on certain days. Um, but you can imagine uh, they're all heading down to South America and in these areas where the land gets really thin, you can actually see uh, some amazing concentrations of these as they funnel through. Um, not only broadwing hawks, but turkey vultures do the same thing. Uh, and in the Western US, you get Swainson's hawks that also do the same. So when you get down into like uh, Veracruz, Mexico, they have what's called the river of raptors where they can uh, oftentimes uh, each year, they'll count over a million uh, uh, turkey vultures and whatnot in one day. It's just uh, really remarkable. Uh, and this is just an image of the black pole warbler I mentioned before. Uh, these are the birds that come down to the uh, northeast coast and then take off out over the Atlantic nonstop and land somewhere in northern South America. Um, they look very different in the spring than they do in the fall. Uh, they all look like this in the fall. Um, very good for blending in uh, in the, in the uh, rainforests of uh, the northern Amazon. Um, and then when spring rolls around, they'll actually head uh, across uh, through the Caribbean like this. So comparatively speaking, much shorter flights. Um, and then they'll go up uh, primarily through the, uh, through the central U.S. on their way up to the breeding grounds. Uh, we've got a couple of shorebird species here. So this is a species that scientists at Manomet have been studying. Uh, they've been using geolocators on these to track their migratory routes. Uh, Semi-palmated sandpipers are some of those birds that are capitalizing on uh, food booms up in the tundra. Uh, so they gorge themselves on mosquito larvae. Of course, the mosquitoes tend to gorge themselves on researchers up there. So um, some of our Manomet scientists have some pretty terrible stories about mosquitoes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, by putting geolocators on, that's what this tiny little thing is right here, um, we've been able to track uh, some of the migratory routes of individual birds. So this is a bird that left uh, Coates Island, which is one of our field sites, and went all the way down to uh, northeastern South America, spent its winter down here, and then uh, flew all the way back up and came along the Atlantic coast. Um, we've actually found uh, varying patterns of migration just with individual birds, and those are probably from different breeding populations. Um, so some birds will actually go up through the center of the U.S. Um, they'll stop over in the prairies to feed on their way north. Um, but we know all of this because we have uh, fairly accurate 
um, location data for individual birds now. Um, another example is the wimbrel. Uh, this is a species that Manomet researchers actually just put another satellite tag on one of these out on, uh, out on Cape Cod last night, I believe. Um, so exciting times for sure. But around this time, uh, a few years ago in September, uh, we placed a satellite tag on a bird on the outer Cape uh, and it took off nonstop, ended up down in uh, northeastern South America, spent its winter down here. And like I was saying, uh, much like some of those semi-palmated sandpipers, uh, it actually went up uh, through the Gulf Coast and then up straight up through the country um, into its breeding area. So huge circuitous uh, migration route for this bird. And you can really see this really illustrates um, how well migratory birds stitch together uh, countries, continents, and hemispheres. Um, and the, the management of bird populations and really monitoring of bird populations. If you see something going wrong with a bird population, you know where that bird has been and where it relies upon, uh, what resources it relies upon. Um, you can better address uh, its survival and honestly, the, the survival of the ecosystems that it uses. Um, so many of you may be wondering how people can help migratory birds. Um, there are some very simple things you can do that actually will make a difference. Any little thing will make a difference. Um, many cities are starting programs where they turn off lights at night. Uh, as you can imagine, a bird that evolved to follow star patterns at night uh, can get pretty confused when the stars are below it when it's flying. Um, and uh, bright lights in particular can actually confound their, their ability to navigate. And oftentimes they'll collide with buildings and unfortunately perish. Um, planting native species is something that we're very passionate about here at Nanomet. Um, we can provide you with more information on what species might work best for you, but I will suggest uh, planting native species that either provide shelter for migratory birds or berries. Um, berries are super important food for fall mi migratory birds, um, and uh, they will definitely appreciate any extra food you've got in your yard. Um, another thing that many of us do uh, is drink coffee. Uh, and uh, much coffee is grown in areas where they cut down an entire forest and just plant coffee, um, which is basically an ecological desert. And the area they cut down probably was the wintering home of something like a magnolia warbler or a Baltimore Oriole. Um, shade grown coffee at least provides a bit more biodiversity and a bit more food and shelter for birds that hang out down there uh, in their off season. Uh, keeping cats indoors, another big one. Uh, believe it or not, cats actually eat a whole lot more birds than, uh, than we'd like to think about. Um, it can be somewhere in the number of billions of birds every single year, which is crazy. Um, so keeping your cat indoors not only will help the birds, but also help your cat too, because it won't get nasty parasites or get run over by a car. So these all seem like good things. Um, and lastly, I would say share birds and birding with others. Um, birds are capable of some amazing things. Like I said, they, they connect people and countries and hemispheres. Um, and just getting out and experiencing uh, birds moving through and just seeing a bird doing what it's doing um, can be really restorative for people. And, and I think it's a really uh, fascinating pursuit um, if you uh, want to get a bit more into it. Um, I would even say introduce young birders to birding um, because if you get started earlier, you've got more time to learn about things. Um, if you know a young birder, uh, please have, and they live in Massachusetts, please have them check out the Massachusetts Young Birders Club. Um, it's a club we're trying to get off the ground here at Manomet. Um, we've just started doing our first field trips. Um, we're gonna be doing some cool online activities as well um, over the course of the winter. So. They can check out massyoungbirders.org. And if you're really interested in uh, philanthropy, uh, you can help support some of our uh, research uh, here that we do on site, as well as our education work um, by helping us celebrate and participate in the annual Birdathon fundraiser. Uh, this year, we'll be doing a big sit. So instead of everyone running around trying to find birds, we'll just be hanging out in one place. Um, so on October 9th and 10th, we'll be here at Manomet headquarters in Plymouth. Uh, I, I encourage you guys to, uh, to join us if you can. Um, I believe there'll be some registration available uh, for different time periods uh, on the website. 
uh, but you can learn more about how you can participate and contribute at manamatbirdathon.com. And with that, I will open the floor to questions and I'm sorry I went so long. That's a really long time to talk. So thank you all. Thank you, Evan. That was uh, excellent. And we have several questions that have come in while you've been talking. Um, so the first question I have for you, a few people have posed it, and it's especially topical for this time of year. Uh, what kind of effects uh, do you see on bird migration um, due to hurricanes or tropical storms? How are the birds adapting or adjusting? That's an excellent question. Um, so for some birds, for some larger birds, um, I should first off say that birds are very, very sensitive to uh, changes in weather. Um, so they're able to detect changes in barometric pressure that, uh, that uh, precede uh, really extreme weather events. Um, so they're actually well aware that a hurricane might be approaching. And a lot of times uh, migratory birds will just kind of hunker down. Now, some birds don't really have that luxury. And we actually documented uh, one of the wimbrel that we put a satellite tag on uh, took off from uh, the outer Cape, um, Cape Cod, and uh, was out over the Atlantic Ocean when a hurricane came barreling up the Atlantic coast. And that bird actually ended up uh, diverting its path even further east out over the Atlantic um, and kind of circumvented the hurricane and was able to get to its wintering grounds okay. But you have to imagine that not all birds are gonna be able to make that adjustment. And uh, the ones that don't have enough fat stores to make that adjustment might not make it. Um, so yeah, we suspect that uh, more extreme weather events like that might uh, end up uh, playing a role in uh, the success of birds' southbound migration. An interesting thing we have noticed and it's sort of anecdotally at this point, um, and we're sort of looking into, is the fact that a lot of Eastern birds, uh, or bird banding stations have noticed that bird wings are getting slightly longer. Um, and so the thought is that longer wing birds might actually make it through extreme uh, storm events like that. Um, and so we might actually be seeing a little bit of evolution happening before our eyes, but uh, really only time will tell if that's actually the case. Um, and more research, but uh, but definitely an interesting little tidbit there for sure. Excellent. Uh, so earlier you were talking about um, how high the birds fly uh, during migration. Is there any information you can give us about how birds decide or determine how high they're going to be flying? And do similar species like warblers flock together at similar altitudes? Yeah, great questions. Um, yeah, I, I think really uh, the height of the birds flying is kind of mandated by uh, weather conditions. Um, so if there's low cloud cover, um, the birds will typically be below that cloud cover if they're migrating. Um, but uh, we do know that certain species of nocturnal migrant do flock together, uh, much like uh, well, not much like, but similar to geese and things. Um, and we know this because uh, they actually will emit uh, little calls that uh, we believe they're using to sort of help nucleate their flocks. Um, so you might have a handful of warblers and maybe a 10 warblers or something of, of maybe even the same species all, all flying overhead at once. Um, and so we suspect that quite a few of these species that give these nocturnal flight calls or NFCs, um, we suspect that a lot of them actually fly in small flocks when they're migrating. Um, so we see this in warblers, we see it in thrushes. Um, oddly enough, we see it in non-songbirds too, like uh, black and yellow-billed cuckoos actually emit these calls too. Um, so they're, they're uh, little tidbits like that that allow us to, to, to cue in on species specific calls of above head or overhead. Um, and uh, in order for us to be able to hear those, they're actually traveling fairly low. So those birds are probably um, under a thousand, uh, thousand feet up um, for the most part. So, uh, so I have a history question for you now. Um, so you mentioned that at Manomet, we've been uh, tracking uh, bird migrations for 56 fall seasons now. Do you know what the oldest record of bird migrations are? 
Uh, well, the oldest banded bird was in Europe uh, around the turn of the century. Is around the, uh, but before then, they actually put uh, people who were into falconry, which is in a relatively uh, archaic art form at these at these points, but it's still actually something that's very much in practice today. It's pretty cool. Um, but uh, the earliest falconers actually marked their birds using specific um, uh, uh, leg bands and jesses and whatnot. Um, so those were actually uh, some of those birds escaped and uh, were then able to be returned to people. So those birds were moving, but not necessarily migrating. Um, in North America, Audubon is attributed with marking, quote unquote, banding the first migratory bird uh, in that he tied some metal thread to the legs of some Phoebes that nested on his property. Um, and according to him, they came back the next year. Um, but uh, the, the organized banding scheme here in North America didn't really get started until the, I believe, the, the, the 50s. Um, and that's when it really sort of caught on. And I think, you know, somewhere in the tens of millions of birds have been banded now in, in North America. So that really is that sort of centralized database that's given us just the sort of baseline information for uh, where birds come from and where they go. Excellent. And um, so I have a question about kind of this season and um, how have things been going in the banding lab this season? And um, a specific one about uh, addressing what percentage of manomet birds are returnees in the fall migration? And is that the same as what you see in the spring? Uh, yeah, I, I think this fall is going pretty well. Uh, we've got some really great banding staff that are that are kicking some butt. And um, yeah, plenty of uh, plenty of birds moving through. Uh, I, you know, I, our migration season really peaks in uh, sort of the second week of September through the month of October. Um, and the species compositions are different throughout that period of time, but um, the, the frequency of birds moving through can be fairly consistent and can be quite good. Um, but yeah, the, quite a few uh, uh, catbirds in the early fall. And uh, in the fall, we see many, many, many young catbirds. Uh, most of the birds that we catch early in the season are what we call HY or hatching year catbirds. And so the young catbirds that we catch, and most of them are probably from the immediate area. Um, but our nets are set up in such a way that we mostly just catch catbirds because they hardly ever spend time above where our nets are. Um, but uh, we see a lot of those uh, catbirds coming back uh, in the spring. Um, but uh, generally, we don't see a ton of birds that don't live on site uh, between springs and falls. It's pretty uncommon for us to catch a bird, uh, an adult bird in the fall, and then re-catch it in the spring. Um, if it's not a catbird or, or a yellow throat that lives on the property. Awesome. And I think we have time for one uh, last question. So how can somebody get involved with the migration research that's going on at Manomet, whether it's uh, volunteer opportunities or, or helping out with tracking data? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, so obviously our volunteer opportunities are fairly compromised given the, the current global situation. Um, but uh, yeah, the banding lab itself isn't the greatest uh, volunteer opportunity just because um, it's uh, such a specialized skill um, and takes a long time to get trained up. That said, we do have some people help out in the banding lab. Um, and we are looking into getting uh, more volunteer opportunities for some of the other monitoring we do. Uh, one of the things we want to start uh, back up is a uh, fall sea watch, um, which is counting ducks that migrate past Manomet Point. Um, it's something we've done decades in the past, uh, but it's been quite a while. And uh, one of the great spectacles in Massachusetts uh, particularly in the Manomet area, any time from mid-September through October is uh, the movement of sea ducks moving past during the day. You can sometimes get tens of thousands moving past, and it's something that not a lot of people know about, but um, it's something we want to be keeping our, our fingers on. So um, we've done some uh, volunteer, uh, we're going to be doing some volunteer opportunities for that in the future, and we've also done some uh, uh, 
uh, over the summer, we did some volunteer bird surveys in the state forest as well. So um, you know, keep tuned on our website if we have volunteer opportunities or our social media, I guess. Excellent. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, that was really fascinating. And thank you, everybody uh, who's still out there for attending and bringing your questions and taking part in our conversation today. I know that many of you are longtime supporters of Manomet, and I just wanted to say thank you. We are very grateful for your generosity and commitment to our organization. I hope that we'll be able to see you again uh, soon, either at the Banding Lab in a few weeks on September 25th. Evan, is that correct? for the Massachusetts Young Birders Club meeting, or, um, or if you can take part in our birdathon uh, the weekend of October 10th, 9th and 10th. Uh, thank you again, everybody, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everybody.